his healing power over our lives. And so what we need in this season is we need mercy. And it was the blood that was on the mercy seat. It justifies an unjustifiable people. Amen. Clap your hands. Clap your hands. Amen. It's giving time in the sanctuary. It's giving time in the house of the Lord. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. It is giving time in the house of the Lord, a time where we come into the holy place and then we decide that we are offer God a sacrifice. We may be offering him a sacrifice according to our offering, which is something that we give God without him asking. We may be giving him a sacrifice through our tithe, which is something that he asks us for. We may be giving him a sacrifice through our alms, through our charity, through giving to someone who is less fortunate than us. That is something God requires of the believer. And then we may be saying, God, I've got myself into a financial situation that grace can't get me out of because grace tried to empower me to steward my money and I didn't do it. Grace was there to empower me a few times after I fell financially and I decided I'm just going to ignore that and continue into what I was in. And then what we do is we decide that we sow a seed to activate the mercies of God. The seed that we sow on today after you pay your tithes and offering, you're going to sow a seed of mercy for your finances. Some of us, the situations that we're in, only mercy can get you out of. Only mercy can get you out of debt. Only mercy can keep you in a recession. Only mercy can pay off that car note. Only mercy can lower, lower interest rates. Only the mercy of God. And you need mercy for your money. You need mercy for the pile of debt that the enemy keeps hanging over your head. You need mercy for your businesses. You need mercy as an entrepreneur. And so as I've been before God, I've looked at Psalms, and we always look at Psalms 23, and the Bible says that the Lord is my, I shall not want. I want you to go to Psalms 23. The Lord is my shepherd. And before we get to the part where it says that I shall not want, we must first activate what it means to have a shepherd. Most people skip to the promise without looking at the principle. And so the promise is that I shall not want, but that's only activated if I make the Lord my shepherd. And if you know anything about sheep and shepherd as it relates to the natural animal, this is such a great comparison for the people of God because the shepherd is always with the sheep. The shepherd always leads and guides the sheep. The shepherd tells the sheep where to eat and where to go. And the shepherd always appoints them a certain place for them to eat and to gain with. And so I find that most believers don't live under the promise of I shall not want because they don't want him as their shepherd. I want you as my Sunday morning entertainment, but you are not my Monday shepherd. I want you when I'm in a time of trouble, but you are not my Tuesday shepherd. I want you so that I can get married, but I don't want you so that I can manage my money. And so in order to live under the fulfillment of I shall not want, you must desire to allow the shepherd to lead every place of your life, even your money. If the shepherd is not over the sheep, then the sheep are subject to danger. The reason why the shepherd, the sheep need a shepherd is because sheep are not aggressive. They don't have any defense mechanisms. Their teeth are not sharp. They don't have claws. They don't have a poisonous venom. They are helpless without a shepherd. 
And if the sheep run away from the shepherd, even the, the, the natural sheep, they cannot see well. They have poor vision. And you know that God is so powerful. Is that look at us, look at we can tell how well we can see by the decisions we've made. By the cars we've bought. Y'all didn't come to have church. By the contracts we've signed, by the job after job after job. We are able to see that as sheep, we don't see well without a shepherd. And so when the sheep decide that they don't want a shepherd, they are subject to danger. One of the greatest enemies to a sheep is a wolf. And the wolf doesn't just come to devour you emotionally. The wolf doesn't just come to devour your marriage. It doesn't just come to devour you as it relates to your gifts in God. But the wolf will come to devour your finances. Because the wolf knows that if your finances are in trouble, you can't focus on God. The wolf knows that if your finances are in trouble, you won't worship God unless it's the first of the month. The wolf knows I don't have to take her out into the world and make her dance. I don't have to take him back to the club. I don't have to take them back to a relationship that's outside of God's will. All I got to do is make them think that they don't need a shepherd over their money. All I have to do is frustrate their finances and they'll miss church. All I have to do is frustrate their bank accounts and they'll stop believing in God. But you ought to open up your mouth and you ought to rebuke every wolf that has come after your money and you ought to tell that wolf I got a shepherd over my bank account I got a shepherd over my money I got a shepherd over my finances I got a shepherd over my deposits I got a shepherd and he's not just a shepherd over my body but he's a shepherd over my checkbook and so what we are facing right now is a bunch of people that should be able to declare, I don't want for anything. What we're facing right now is a bunch of people who are losing hope because a recession that was prophesied two years before today has come up upon the believers. And so because we didn't account and listen to the prophetic word, we're suffering. And so you got to cry out for the mercies of God. You got to tell the Lord, Lord, I want you to be Lord over every penny that I have. I want you to be Lord over all of my finances. When I get my check, I want you to be Lord over it. I surrender today from being Lord over my own money. Father, I want to live under the canopy of I shall not want. I want to live under the mercy of I shall not want. I don't want to worry about my finances. I want to make you the shepherd over my money. I want to make you the Lord over my money. And when you make him the shepherd, You don't withhold your seed because then you understand that if I withhold my seed, I withhold my harvest. When you make him Lord over your finances, he'll make you believe for stuff that you don't qualify for. When you make him Lord over your finances, he will open up doors that no man can shut. He will take positions out of people's hands who have not made him shepherd, and he will give you those positions. I think I said this on last week. If I be not a prophet of God, I will never stand up in a pulpit and tell you anything different. I said this on last week. If we in this house, for those of you, the Bible said if you receive a prophet in the name of a prophet, you will receive the prophet's reward. I said in this house, for every individual who's giving the Lord his lordship back over your money, we may weep about some stuff in 2024, but we ain't going to weep about money. We're not going to cry about finances. We're not crying about jobs 
in position. So I prophesy in this house that you shall not want. I prophesy in this house that you shall not beg. I prophesy in this house that you shall not rob Peter to pay Paul. I prophesy in this house that you're not going to have to move money around to make your bills. I prophesy in this house that you're not going to live in the red. I prophesy in this house that God is about to break protocol for you. He's about to break protocol for your family. And it is so. Somebody shout in Jesus' name. I said in Jesus' name. Now, if, last week I prophesied, and we got some testimonies this week. Y'all ain't loud enough. You're going to get loud in a minute. Because I'm never going to stand up before God's people and say anything that God didn't say. And so for those of you who are still waiting on the promises of God, I guarantee you, your faith is about to be activated right now. And you going to know that you've been in the midst of a life changing God. You going to know that this is a house full of money miracles. And if it can happen for my neighbor, it can happen. It can happen for me. If it can happen for my neighbor, it can happen for my house. Now hold on. Listen, cause y'all ain't got y'all ain't got a reason to run yet. You just hold on. There, there was a there was a woman. I'm gonna leave her anonymous. But she came to the house of the Lord and she said, prophetess, she saw me on Monday. She said, prophetess, I've been struggling so bad. She said, I, 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 I saved up $3,000. And she said, I just started going through a rough time in my finance. It was my car. Remember when I told y'all to lay hands on your cars and anoint your cars because the enemy will try to bring frustration in our finances by causing issues in a car and so she started having issues in her car and which kind of came and ate up a lot of her savings account which put her in a deficit and she said prophetess while you were up doing offering she said prophetess I sold my last three dollars she said all I had was three dollars and she said that's all I gave I gave those three dollars in faith now this is a person that didn't have food this is a person that couldn't pay their mortgage. This is a person that didn't even have gas. They had to get a ride to church on Monday. Now, I don't understand how folk got gas and won't come to church. But she said, I needed to get into the house of the Lord. I didn't have to catch a ride. I didn't even have gas. And she said, prophetess, I sold my last $3 on Sunday and didn't have food. On Monday, somebody brought me groceries that filled my entire refrigerator. Three dollars. Three whole dollars. Baby, you can't flip food stamps and get that kind of breakthrough. Three dollars turned into a refrigerator full of groceries. Now, for somebody that got food in their refrigerator, that may not make you shout. But for somebody that was trying to figure out where their next meal was coming from, that's a miracle for those of us who say, God, I trust you with my land. I trust you with my lands. Now, of course, I didn't let her just stay with groceries. Of course, as a leader, I'm not going to let you not have. So for anybody that was saying the church should have taken care of her, trust me, she got a seed. From, she didn't get it from the church, but she got a seed. I made sure that she had what she needed. Because you don't let some know that somebody is in a struggle and not help them. Not people that got themselves in a struggle. That's a different story. Not you went and got your nails done, and now you want somebody to help you pay your bills. No, that's a different story. So the church, so so somebody in the church did their part. First at the discipleship class. Y'all got the picture, don't put it up yet. One of my daughters came up to me. Now I got on the phone with her on, I think we talked on Monday. Get on the phone. And we had a good long talk. 
We talked about some things. There was some corrections that went forth. This is why you got to be careful about getting mad when you get a correction. Because the enemy might try to hold up your breakthrough. So we on the phone. I'm giving her all kind of instruction. I'm telling her from the top to the bottom. I'm being the prophet that God called me to be. And so she take that correction. And she also took the encouragement. And we start working on the game plan. We get off the phone on Thursday. She come up to me and she say, prophetess, look what just got deposited into my bank account y'all ain't come to hell church oh y'all think it's y'all think it's a scam God will never scam you when the Lord says that we ain't gonna weep about money in 20 Oh, look at your neighbor and say, it only gets better. When she showed it to me, when she showed it to me, I said, what's that? Because I'm trying to see, you know, is this, is this a regular payment? I'm trying to make sure because I know what I heard the Lord say on last Sunday. She said, it's an unexpected deposit. She wasn't looking for it. It wasn't supposed to come. I don't know who need an extra $4,000. And I don't know what she sold on last Sunday. But I don't know who need an extra $4,000. You don't have to compromise to get wealth. You don't have to compromise your integrity for God to raise you up. This ain't for nobody special. This wasn't a person that got a title. All she did was heard from God through the mouth of the prophet, received the word by faith, and by Thursday, she was $4,000 wealthier. I believe in Jesus' name that miracles are about to break out on your road. Miracles are about to break out in your family. And I don't care what your degree is. I don't care what your title is. God is about to make a way. We got one more. I got one more. You want to tell it? I got one more. Now, if you ain't got no tennis shoes on, you probably going to have to take your tennis shoes off. You probably going to have to take your heels off for this one. I got one more. Testify, son. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We overcome by the word of our testimony. I'm going to say that verse from Romans 12. He come by shit in the book. She come by shit in the book. Romans 12 and 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word. I'm sorry. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. I sowed a seed of $500 last Sunday. Also, I, the prophet said to sow a seed to a single mother. I had already did that that morning before she said it. And I also, this week, I sowed a seed to a married couple. Thursday, I got an email. I was going to close. I got a truck driving school, right? I was shutting it down. I, I couldn't. I just couldn't maintain, but but uh, Thursday, I got an email, a grant, which of course, you, you don't have to pay a grant back. I told God, I'm not getting any more loans. I knew how to get loans, knew about business credit and things like that. I told God, I'm not getting any more loans. It is over. I'm going to be debt free at 24. I got an email, $250,000 grant. As long as there's nothing in your heart that's jealous, 
if you say if the Lord is in my church, uh, then he in my neighborhood. Uh, if he doing it for people in my church, uh, and I'm under the same covering, uh, and I'm told into the same offering, uh, that means what God has for me uh, must be right around the corner. You better believe God for acceleration. Uh, I don't know what approval you need, uh, but I decree and I declare that it's coming to your house. Uh, put a praise on
To the point where she would have to take medicine every day in order for her to bear with the pain that she has, but the pain never went away. And this is something that's been antagonizing her for a while. Well, on that altar, that altar call that we called, she came forth coming to receive healing. And I laid hands on her. And she says when she went home, till this day, it was three weeks ago, from the time she went home to this day, there is no more back pain. And here it is, she don't have to take medication anymore. See, it's a miracle when you no longer have to rely on a secondary substance to function. But the healing power of God hit her body and now she's healed. Come on. diagnosis reverse we've seen that happen in this house and the Lord told me he says not only will you don't be crying over money in 2024 but he said to let this church know that you won't be crying over diagnosis and sickness in 2024 if you believe that put a down payment of running on that I tell you to run and believe God by faith that in 2024 sickness won't find my house in 2024 Thank you, Lord, for negative diagnosis. I thank you, Lord, that sickness and pain will not be my family's portion. Hallelujah. All right, we got one more testimony, and then I'm gonna go into the word. Hallelujah. Woo! Well, it's uh, Sister Martha. Amen. Hold on, wait before you post the picture. I'm going to let Sister Martha come on up. And I'm going to let her go ahead and testify. And then I'm going to jump into the word. Hallelujah. She, I love the little shit. Come on. 
I'm telling you, poverty won't know your name in 2024. And sickness won't know your name. Cancer won't know your name. Leukemia won't know your name. Heart disease won't know your name. Come on, I dare you to believe arthritis won't know my name in 2024. Any sickness will be disconnected in the name of Jesus. All right, Sister Mom, come on up, daughter. I want you to come, Sheriff. She want me to tell her. I'll tell her for her. I believe this day was, or uh, had to be Wednesday, or Wednesday uh, night. We got a report that a sister Martha uh, had been in a car accident. Now, I want you to hear something. We emphasize the importance of prayer here at Dominion City Church. And part of our prayer is we cover each member's lives. We cover your finances, your children, your marriage, your family. And so oh, we really believe in the power of prayer. And even Monday, just covering the people of God in prayer. And so Wednesday, we got a call that Sister Martha got into a car accident. And of course, we called and, and to check on her. And uh, we just was thanking God for her, that God covered her life. And encouraged her because even though the car was totaled, I said, though the car is totaled, just thank God you're still kept. But here's the miracle. When I saw the picture of the car, it took me into a place. I want you to see that vehicle. When I saw the picture of the car, and she told me that she came out with just a few bruises, no broken bones. Oh, y'all don't want to help have church. She's here running in church, shouting, because when God has been a keeper in your life, you should resemble it by giving him praise. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, the weapon may form, but it will not prosper. If you believe that, go ahead and take 20 seconds and give him praise right there. tell you that this is why we take serious protecting the presence and glory of God that's in this church because it's evident when the glory of God is in a place when God responds with miracles and testimonies and signs so there has nothing to do with us but it has everything to do with the faithfulness of a true living God that is abide among the people amen and so we thank God one more time. Can we give God honor one more time for all that he's doing? Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we thank God. And I just, her obedience, uh, our prophet, is because prophets, if you search the scriptures, they help usher in miracles through the prophetic word, through obedience and declaring what God is saying. And so we thank God. God used the voice of a prophet to usher in, come on, this financial breakthrough and miracle. So we thank God for our obedience and prophesying 
what thus says the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You have your Bibles with you. I want to go ahead and jump right into the word of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Woo. God is truly faithful to Dominion City Church. Amen. He is so faithful to us, and we thank God. This is why we worship. This is why we praise. This is why we give him the glory. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, while you turn your Bibles, Proverbs 22 and 1. Amen. That's where I will uh, begin to go into the scriptures. And so uh, I just want to add, amen, we had a phenomenal time on last night. Come on, praise the Lord. Come on, couples, make some noise, couples. Come on. Hallelujah. Amen. And so uh, they brought out uh, my sonic boom with a south uh, uh, germ major in the J5 <laughs> edition. Amen. And so uh, we had a phenomenal time last night. But the most important thing I love about our church is our ability to uh, cultivate uh, the importance of marriage and family. Amen. And so it's very important as marriages that we learn to uh, honor each other. Uh, do life together, celebrate, dance, and honor the Lord. And so they had me, I just telling you, uh, we just all type of slow jams and uh, everything that you can imagine we did on last night. And so I'm just so grateful um, to everything we did from the cha-cha slide, the electric slide. Uh, I mean, we did some of everything. The DJ, I mean, he just kept going. I'm like, man, I don't know if I'm going to be able to keep up. And so I'm telling you, it was a powerful time in God. And uh, we just thank the Lord for the love here at Dominion City Church. Amen. Amen. And so I thought who's going to play my jam, you know, it reminds me of my woman. Uh, Keith Sweat was singing a song like, Nobody. And uh, nobody can come close to Prophetess Ashley Brown in my life. There's nobody. I say it two times, nobody can do me like Jesus, and nobody can do me like Providence Ashley Brown. Come on. <laughs> nobody, 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 nobody can do me like her. And I tell you, nobody can love our church and serve our church the way she does. Nobody can cook shrimp and grits. <laughs> and bless us on Wednesday, and then come around Thursday and have us crying at the altar, getting our life together, teaching on heaven and hell, nobody. And so I thank God for my wife and who she is. She's so valuable to me, and there's not a price that I can put beside her name. She's so valuable to me, and I love you, sweetheart. All right, from verse 22 and 1, I'm ready to preach. We're in a series called Fortified. And uh, it's been a powerful, life-changing series, and we want to continue to uh, commit to what the Lord is saying. And uh, we've dealt with a lot over the course of the last month, and I want to continue. I feel led to stay in that flow from last week because the Lord says, I just need to clarify, continue to clarify some things. And so uh, Proverbs 22 and 1, the scripture says, the Bible says, and a good name is to be more desired than great wealth. Favor is better than silver and gold, right? A good name is to be more desired than great wealth, and favor is better than silver and gold. First Timothy 3 and 7, I want to read one more scripture. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. I want to come from a subject. I want to talk about mislabeled part two. Mislabeled part two. And I'm going to give you a sub topic. Don't call my church a cult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to say it yeah. don't, don't call my church a cult. Don't, don't call. Now look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. Don't call my church a cult. Look at the other neighbor. The other neighbor didn't hear that. Guy. Say, neighbor. Don't call my church a cult. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you now. We give you honor in this place. And we magnify your holy name. And we give you glory. Father, we pray, God, that you will be uplifted and magnified like never before in this ministry moment. God, move in this place. God, we declare in this room that destinies will be reset. 
we thank you father that our futures will be fortified and lord we thank you that we are the head and not the tail above and not beneath blessed in the city and blessed in the field blessed when we come out and blessed when we come out so father we honor you now and give you glory and we thank you that this word will not return unto you lord in jesus name we do pray amen amen and amen you may be seated in the presence of god amen hallelujah glory to god amen we're talking about being fortified because there are three levels that will indicate labels all right god labels us and understanding that as god labels us we label ourselves and people will label you and so when God labels you, the beauty, beautiful thing about God labeling you is one thing about the labels of God, it can never be revoked. God can never take it back. God doesn't change the label that he's placed over your life just because you have been hidden, just because you ran from God, just because you have fallen, just because you have made a mistake. Just because you had a baby out of wedlock, just because uh, you have fell into some type of heavy sin, just because you may be struggling with some type of addiction and habit, just because you just don't feel like walking into God's assignment, it does not change what he has stapled and what he has stamped over your life. It comes by birth. The Bible says, he told Jeremiah, before you were even born, I knew you and I ordained you to be the prophet. He labeled him as a prophet to the nations. And so when God labels you, it is something so special because nothing we can do can remove the label. Oh, that should be something that's worth giving God praise for because no matter how nasty I've been, no matter how crazy and arrogant and prideful I've been, God, I thank you that that label does not disappear, that that label is strong and it's settled over my life. Come on. And though I've been fallen, I may be in sin, I may be away from God. All I have to do is come near to him and that label is activated. Why? Because God does not turn away the label that he's placed over your life or oh, you ought to give God praise there that the label of being a prophet that the label of being an evangelist that the label of being a teacher that the label of being a mother, a wife a husband and a father label of being the one he has called you to be does not change no matter what season you're in no matter what you go through you ought to give God praise God I thank you that the label has not changed and God all I have to do is repent and get into alignment and what you have called me to be I will bring it forth I will bring forth the calling and the label that you placed over my life hallelujah and so as we give it in but then the tragedy there are uh, opponents and weapons that comes against God's label over your life uh, because uh, one thing about it you uh, God labels you but then we label ourselves uh, many of you if one thing that you need to be healed of more than anything is your own interpretation of who you are uh, some of you, it doesn't matter what people have interpreted you to be. It doesn't matter what the world and society has interpreted, but what do you interpret yourself to become? Many of you see yourself through the lens of your own parents' mistakes. Many of you see yourself through the lens of your own trajectory and your past hurdles that you had to climb. Many of you see yourself through the lens of being insecure and broken. And though you have weaknesses, does not mean your weakness weaknesses is your identity. Come on, your weaknesses are a part of who you are to establish the greatness of God in your life. But you have to get into a place, I gotta stop seeing myself like this. I'm in heaviness and depression because I see myself in a place of inferiority. I'm in this valley because I see myself below the standard of what God has called me to be. So if anything, you need to be healed in your eyes of how you see yourself. And people will label you. It comes with the calling. And you have to be okay with people mislabeling you. You have to be okay with people having their own interpretation of who you are. And being okay that it doesn't matter what their interpretation is because their interpretation doesn't override God's interpretation. So understand that reality is important because people 
sometimes will interpret you or label you based upon their own expectations. And if I can't meet your expectations, then you begin to label me based upon your own discernment and viewing. And God, through his grace, breaks us through that interior, breaks us through that moment so that we can walk into the kingdom identity that God has placed over our life. Now, moving on, not only uh, do uh, people label uh, individuals, but even businesses have labels on them. Ministries have labels on them. And what God has called me to do in seven years, uh, I've never touched on this topic. I never addressed it. I never spoke about it. But the Lord has released me to deal with uh, the elephant in the room, all right? And I'm not doing this from a personal or carnal perspective. I'm doing this from a spiritual place because Jesus in the book, Gospel of Matthew, chapter 16, verse 13 and 14, he asked the people who followed him, who do people say that I am? And they began to tell him all the rumors that they've heard about him. They say you, John the Baptist. They say you are Elijah. But then he began to clarify, who do you say that I am? And so what we begin to deal with, I begin to ask uh, the church and the people, who do people say Dominion City is? All right. And, and so we begin to walk down each step. Some say we're cold. Man, you're getting quiet every time. Some say we're cold. Come on. And some say we about money. They taking the folks' money, ain't no building. Well, we in a building. <laughs> now, I know preachers that take money and you never see a building for them. You still wait on a building. It's been 30 years later and they still take your money. But you ought to be glad that you're in a part of an integral house. That when you give your money, you see where your money going. When you give your money, your money will be turned from seed and turn it to harvest. You ought to be glad that God a house of integrity before all right all right you see it so um they take your money you have to have a contract to join the church raise your hand if you sign a contract every ministry asks for your basic information to contact you to be informed so you can be informed about the duties of the ministry but there's no contract signing their prophet thinks she all that. Let's go a little deeper. She tell folk business. Because one of the things about witches and people who hate prophets or Jezebel spirits, they will say the prophet tells your business to try to discredit the value of what comes out of the prophet's mouth. And so they say they tell your business so that you can be detoured from the mouth of the prophet because witches don't want you to be led by God through prophecy because prophecy is the vehicle that God uses to not only lead you to Jesus but to save you from disaster. And so if you don't hear a prophetic word, then you cannot have, watch this, the guidance that you need to overcome the obstacles that the enemy will place before you. So raise your hand in the room if the woman of God has told your business. Yeah. See, see, the thing about this moment, I know it's maybe a little uncomfortable. Why he doing it? Let me tell you, I'm not a minister, I'm an apostle. See, I stand in the office of an apostle, so I got jurisdiction and ranking and order from God to deal with principalities, to deal with governmental lies, and to shut down the operation of the enemy, because we will be a fortified house, and in order for us to be fortified, we have to be strong, not to let the lies of the enemy, not to let gossip and rumors from the outside ever come in and infiltrate in this house. So we've been dealing with that. Why am I doing this? Because I want to make sure that where we're going in 2024, we cannot be weakened by what people say. We cannot be detoured by rumors, slander. Now, we talk about what's a cult because that's one of the main uh, lies that have been stapled over about our church is that Dominion City Church is a cult. And through our teaching last week, we shut down that argument about our church being a cult. Now, why? Our people, it's, it's crazy how people can be in cults but call you a cult. <laughs> crazy, some of you got cultic relationships. Your baby daddy don't let you go out. Your baby daddy don't let you answer the phone. You got to get permission to leave the house, but yet you let your baby daddy call the church a cult and you stop coming when you are in a relationship with somebody that has a cult. You are in a car of a cult in your relationship. I 
ain't got help in here. I ain't got help. I'm going to keep working. <laughs> and so what we do, so people will call things a cult. Number one, people will mislabel you when they don't understand you. Some of you, you are not understood. That's why people mislabel you. That's why they call you names that are not true because they don't understand the way you carry yourself. They don't understand your lifestyle, your decision making, your function. It doesn't look like nobody in your family. So you mislabeled. You're called the crazy one in the family. You're called the one that has lost their mind. Why she want to live for Jesus? They, she just lost her mind going to that church. She just lost her mind going to church all the time. But yet you all oh God help me in this room you always at the come on the liquor store all the time you at the Trudeau man's house all the time you everywhere else all the time but you worry about me being at church Let me, let me go deeper in here. <laughs> and so people will mislabel. So people don't understand when, whenever you are uh, living in a lane that's secluded from the norm, people will always mislabel you. Yeah. So most churches, not all, most churches in our region is full of religion. Yeah. Most churches in our region uh, do not open up the heart of prophecy and miracles and healing and breakthrough they only have an interpretation of the Bible that says service should be a certain way all the time, no one should shout no one should give God glory and the Bible says that everything that has breath <laughs> praise the Lord <laughs> I'm on, we, come on, they look down on churches that specialize in prayer and praying in tongues because the Bible says, Paul said I wish you all prayed in tongues <laughs> I wish you would pray because the Bible says that tongues is how we edify ourselves. But in these religious structures, they don't want to pray in tongues because religious people like control. And anything that goes beyond control, they will push out. We can't control. Tongues is something the Holy Spirit gives you. The supernatural is something that churches and man can't control. And so because they can't control it, they would rather dismiss it. Church that doesn't want uh, this region, most churches, not all churches, most churches reject prophecy. Reject prophets. We reject apostles. Reject the power of God moving in such a great and grand way. Reject seeing the hand of God flowing. And so this region wants to be adopted to this place of great religion. And so any church that speaks in tongues, any church where the members run and shout and dance and give God praise, any church that believes in prayer, any church that prays in tongues and believe and truly living holy, because a lot of people in the region loves to call themselves ministers and pastors, but they sleep in with choir members. Come on, the deacons love to call themselves deacons, but they're the main ones ones running to the liquor store buying a filth. And so when you have a church that submits to standards this region will call that church a cult. They will mislabel that church a cult because it doesn't want to embrace the fullness of who God is in the Bible. So we're getting to the word of the Lord because of some of the expressions about what a cult is, we talked about it. I just want to take some of the main ones. Uh, the, number one, you are on a cult, and I, and I sympathize with people who've been under uh, a cult or a cult of leadership. When you have leaders who are part of a cult, it is very traumatic. It is a narcissist literally leading you, telling you what to do. Because in a cult, they don't tell you how to think, they tell you what to think. And the thing about our church, we tell you what the word of God says, but we also teach you how to think, not what to think. How to think about marriage, how to think about life, how to make decisions. And if you ever came to us about anything for advice, we would never tell you what to do. You are grown. And one thing about our leadership approach, we will not tell you what to do. We will give you suggestions. We will offer up suggestions to you. We will give you things to consider. But at the end of the day, that decision is left up to you. All right? And so that's very important to understand. And so in cultic leadership, they try to control who you date. They try to control who you marry. They try to control where you live, where you go. Uh, they, if I'm called to move. They try to tell you that you ain't called to move. And if you move, you will be cursed. 
when you're a part of a cult church, you can't leave the church. Because we have to understand that people are called to churches in seasons. And so when the, some people may have a season where their time is up, they have the liberty. In this church, you have the liberty when God tells you your season is up to transition and we will bless you. But most churches, when you leave, you're going to be cursed. You're going to be called all kind of names. You're going to die and go to hell all because God called you to leave a ministry. Because when pastors are insecure, they don't have the proper interpretation of knowing that they don't own or control nobody. But when you don't know who you are as a man, you try to control every single person that comes through the doors. So this church, they don't, we don't have any of those problems. You're free to transition and we will bless you. People have come to ministry and have left. We've blessed them. We thank God for them coming. We appreciate them. And so we've honored them because of their sacrifice, the time that they gave. But I'm telling you, it's a painful feeling. I know what it feels like to leave a place and be cursed. To leave a place and be hated. And so you just have to be in a place where you're commissioned to say, I'm going to be strong to know that God is calling me to do all that he's called me to do. So moving on, um, also with, well, that's alongside that lens uh, in a cult church, um, you know, you can't ever um, visit another church. You gotta get permission uh, to visit another church. You, gotta, you, you can't you can't go nowhere to another church. Now I want to give clarity because um, here's the thing: uh, there's nothing wrong with you know family friends day or your family say, hey, I want you to come and, and, and visit the church with us. Cool, no, no problem at all. But if you are truly faithful at your church, if you're truly satisfied, this is the place God has set and called you to be. Though you don't have to ask for permission from our church to go go anywhere or visit or miss church, you don't have the extra permission at all. But if this is the place where you're getting fed and this is the place where you're growing, I'm up to the place where I don't even want to miss because this is the place where God is leading and strengthening me to grow the things of God. So when the Bible says in Psalms 92 and 13, for those that are planted in the house of the Lord. See, this is a key word. Underline planted. Because you cannot be planted if you're visiting five different churches every week, but you say you belong here. <laughs> Nothing wrong with you missing church. Nothing wrong with you going to visit a church. But every week you just come once a month here and you go to a, this church here, Mac Macedonia Baptist here. You're going to all these different churches and you wonder why you can't flourish in the house because it takes you being planted. And when a plant is planted, it don't move. When a plant is planted, it settles itself. When a plant is planted, it takes time to nourish whatever is coming to them in that set place. But how are you planted when you're 20 different places? How are you planted in nothing wrong? Who should welcome the, the list? But you got to be careful having 40 different people speaking in your ears. And some of us are so confused about Jesus because you're listening to so different people. You're listening to psychics. You're listening to people who are mediums or saying all different kind of things. You're listening to all these incredible voices because we have to be careful just because the word sounds good or the word is right doesn't mean the spirit is right behind it. Behind every teaching and word, there's a spirit in operation. So what spirit are you allowing to speak into your life because they sound good? Very, very cautious. I have a small group of people who I allow to speak, speak to my life. People who I give my ear to, my heart to. My focus to I'm very, very careful to have a small group of people. I don't listen to a whole lot of people. I don't just share my ear and my heart with everybody. Because everybody's spirit behind what they're saying is not adequate. And so, you've got to be planted. If you're planted, you will grow. If you're planted, you will take off. If you're planted, watch how your life exceeds. Some of us we, we have never we robbed ourselves of seeing the fullness of blessing. Because if you will remain planted, committed to a place, or committed to a thing, you will get a chance to see the fullness of that blessing manifest. What would have happened if you would have stayed at that job longer? What would have happened if you would have learned how to endure just that small hardship? Why? What would have happened if you didn't quit because times got hard? 
What would have happened if you just didn't walk out? What would have happened if you would have stayed planted, if you would have stayed committed when it got tough? Where would you be by now? But for some of us, when it gets hard, we quit. When it gets hard, we step out. When it gets hard, we move on. Some of you, you miss your dream husband. You miss your dream wife. They were your husband. They were your wife. But you didn't know how to just come out of self-pity. You didn't know how to learn how to be committed and learn that no matter what is valuable in your life, it will have tough times. Anything great will have tough seasons. But some of us, we robbed ourselves of seeing the fullness of God's miracles because this is what we've been doing. When it gets hard, I can't do this no more. One small disagreement, you cut off your connections. People who who are called to help you. People who can help take you to the next level. One small misunderstanding. See, I knew you were just like the other person. Off a small misunderstanding, you just like my cud, you just like my lad, you just like my ex, you just like my I, see this shirt, just like my last shirt. One little misunderstanding. Oh, this, I knew this shirt like my last shirt, and now you ain't planted, and now you miss your harvest season. This is why it's important for us to heal before we move on to something new. Because the new has to pay for what the old did because you did not heal from the pain. Planting the house of the Lord. We don't control you. We don't tell you what to do. We, that's not who we are. But I'm giving you Bible because one thing about this is we talked about being planted because I want you to understand this, this magnitude. You married uh, and you, you, you had a house. But it'd be crazy to be married to somebody and then sleep in another house. You just got quiet right there. How you marry, you committed to one person, but you sleep in somebody else's house. It would be crazy to work for Wendy's, go to Wendy's with McDonald's clothes on. <laughs> Moving on. Hebrews 13, 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Because some of us, because you've been under cult leadership, people who control you, tell you what to do, you can go nowhere, you can do nothing, you can miss church, you could, I mean, you could lead the church, I mean, all these different things. Some of you who are even visiting, God's calling you to join, but you're scared what your cult leader's going to say. You can't leave. You can't transition because you're scared if you would join this church, you're going to get hound, you're going to get nailed to the cross. But what I'm, I'm called to preach to, I'm going to preach a boldness. The Bible says that the apostles in the book of Acts, they were bold. And when you bold, you don't care about no consequences. When you bold, can't nobody lie on you and stop you from obeying God. When you truly carry boldness. So Hebrews 13, 7 said, have confidence in your leaders. Submit to their authority. Because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. All right, do this so their work will be a joy and not a burden, for that would not be no benefit to you. But the key word, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. This is powerful. Confidence is built over time. Confidence is built over time. But you can't give no one confidence if your view of them is already distorted by what your past experiences are. So you want to come with an open heart to give one confidence. And, and the reason why this generation, I really have a, a burden and a heart for this generation is because many people say this is the most rebellious generation that we have. And though that has some truth to that statement, here's the tragedy in understanding this. The reason why this generation struggles with submitting to authority is because they don't know how to trust authority. <laughs> Imagine having your parents throw you away with no explanation and give you to your grandmama and yet your grandmama treat you like trash. Imagine seeing people who are called, who who are responsible to cover you or lead you, abuse you. And so this generation deals with a lot of distrust and this is why it's hard to follow or submit to authority. So before we label them rebellious, how about we help them understand or show them proper love and proper authority so that they can transition into following or submitting under authority. Have confidence in your leaders. Submit to their authority. So though we don't tell you what to do, though we don't control your life, not here, we ain't going to tell you who to marry, 
The Bible says you're still called to submit to the authority of your leader. To where you learn to listen to the leadership of your leader in a godly way and not in a place of control. Now moving on, I want to talk about names because one of the things about God was he's been speaking to me about names in this room. Names are very powerful. Names have a lot of great spiritual significance. In the names, you have the blueprint of God. When it comes to names, when God gives names, it brings definition and distinction. It brings origin, a genesis. It, every name has comes with identity. And you have to understand, when it comes to your name, your name is very valuable to God. The Bible says a good name, the scripture says, a good name is what should be more desired than great wealth. And this is a generation that's pursuing great wealth, but not pursuing a great name. Amen. And it's important in this season that you understand the importance of you having a good name. Good names are very important because that word name in the Hebrew means reputation. And what happens when you have sacrificed your reputation all in the aspect of trying to please people? Good name is very valuable because what comes with having a good name is the first thing is integrity. Integrity is the highest call to having a good name. Because dishonesty will cause your name to be devalued, disvalued. You want to have high integrity. The more integral you are and the more pure you are, it will validate you having a good name. But Living a life of dishonesty will discredit your name. Living a life where you hide. Living a life where you don't present facts. Living a life where you don't measure up to being honest to people. Living a life where you take from people behind their back. Living a life where you present one thing but behind people's back you are a totally different version of who you are. You are presenting dishonesty and dishonesty will discredit your name. Your name is everything you have. Your name is what God has placed on you. Your name carries weight. You have to understand that your name carries significance. That when your name is mentioned it's more than just identifying who you are. Your name speaks for you. See, sometimes you don't have to tell people who you are. Just let them know who your name is. When you have established your name. And this is why it's very important that you watch who you connect to because your connections will either enhance your name or it will weaken your name. This is why you cannot be associated with everybody who calls themselves great because if your character is challenged, if your character is conflicted, then if I place myself in association with you, then I'm going to have my name diminished and I'm going to have my name mislabeled. So you have to understand it's important to have the right associations. The Bible says that our character is corrupted because of the circles that we're connected to. And this is why God is calling some of you to seclude yourself. I'm secluding myself because I'm protecting my name. I'm secluding myself because if you cheat on your wife and I'm in association with you, two things are going to happen. People are going to think I cheat on my wife or oh, what's on you going to fall on me. And now I'm going to be corrupted because I'm letting my name get in circles that are unauthorized. We have to be careful who we are, who you do business with who you partner with, who you marry. All of this matters when it comes to having a good name. Yeah. So moving on and on, names are very powerful. I want you to understand that also when it comes to names, the Bible even says that we must have a good reputation. When you are in the process, the infancy stages of building anything, it's important that you walk it out in integrity and faithfulness and diligence. Because if you're in the infancy stages of anything, you are establishing a name. And most of us in infancy stages, we did not handle those seasons correctly. And so we have allowed that business, that name to have a bad reputation because of how we managed it. Got to have a good reputation. So in order to do that, I have to build strategically. I have to build with diligence. I have to build with being faithful. I have to be a man or a woman of my word. If you can't follow your word, how can you be listed as being integral? 
It's very important in the process of building anything. It's very important that what you tell people, the expectations you give people, that you meet those expectations. It's better to underpromise and overdeliver than to overpromise and underdeliver. And we have to be careful overpromising or overcompensating who we are, what we can do. When you know you're only limited to doing one set of things. But when you tell people, giving them all these promises, but yet you show little action or little ability to follow through, then how can you have credibility of having a good name? A good name comes with also development. It does a disservice to your name to not grow. You're the same person you were five years ago. You still think the same. You still handle conflict the same. You don't apply reading books. You don't read no books. You're just going by just thinking about social media and what you hear on social media is going to equip you for the future. You don't read any books. You don't read the Bible. You don't pray. You don't fast. You don't put the work in to develop yourself. So development is a part of you. Watch this, having a strong or a good name. But if you don't develop yourself as a man, if you don't develop yourself as a woman, how are you going to have a good name? How are you going to have a reputation that's able to fight against the resistance of the enemy? So not developing is putting yourself in a position to not have a good name. So some of you, you, you don't have a good name. It's not because you necessarily do bad things. I haven't grown. And so what people need as it relates to my calling they cannot receive because I'm void of development I got to grow look at me I got to grow I got to go 2024 going to be a year of growth I got to come higher in my growth I have to come higher in my development I got to go higher in who God is calling me to be so in emphasis stages is very important some of you have been getting ready to come into infancy stages where God's going to put something in your hands that's going to require your ability to build it, to grow it, to cultivate it. And when it's in your hands, you got to make sure you manage it well. In the dating process, the dating process is very important. How you date matters. You're building a reputation. How do you handle yourself matters. You're building a reputation. How you treat people matters. You're building a reputation. And most of us, we have poor reputations because we have a poor understanding of how to value people. We don't know how to handle people, so it causes us to have poor reputations. Longevity builds reputations. Do you have longevity? Some of us, we can do right as long as we're not in the storm. Some of us, we can be obedient as long as nobody has gotten on our nerves. Some of us, we can stay on the right path until you get a man. Some of you, you can be celibate by yourself, but soon you get a man, you dropping it like it's hot. And your reputation be discredited because people know that you're not faithful and loyal. Where's your longevity? The enemy knows if the seasons of your life are distorted, you will not maintain that consistency of loyalty or commitment. You have a prayer life that's strong. The moment somebody don't like you, you stop praying for months. There's no longevity. Longevity, consistency builds a good name. What are you consistent at? What are you building? Are you the same person every day or are you fraudulent because you'll change because you're in a bad place? You have not grown until you've gotten into a bad place and you still say, look, I'm still going to be loyal. I'm still going to be faithful. I'm still going to speak to people. I'm still going to be nice. I'm still going to love people. I'm still going to be who God's called me to be. But some of us, we only can be consistent when it's convenient. But in seasons where there's inconvenience, you cannot be faithful. But what gives you a good name is longevity. In 2024, you've got to have longevity. 
You got to have the ability to keep it up when it's hard to keep it up. You got to have the ability to stay focused when it's hard to stay focused. You have to have the ability to have a longevity in 2024. I'm not going to change because life is not going well. My finances may go low, but I'm still coming to church. Come on. It may be hard financially, but listen, I'm not going to stop coming to church. I'm not going to stop worshiping. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop winning souls to Christ. I don't care how hard it's get. I have longevity. Come on, I won't get tired. I won't burn out. Come on, you got to get into a place where you retell yourself that though it gets hard, though it's tough, I will not fall. Do you have longevity? Can you be faithful in the midst of crisis? You got to have a great name. So the name, and then God changes names. We're in a season where God's renewing names. Ooh. I'm here to tell you, God's going to renew some names. See, Satan wants to, he, he's been changing your name for so long. Because the Bible says when Daniel and, and Hananiah and Michael, when they came to present themselves to Babylon, those was the first strategy of the enemy. When they were in Babylonian captivity, he changed their names to Belazar, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He changed their name into having hopes that they will change their identity, that they will change their doctrine, that they will change their belief system. And some of you, the enemy is trying to change your name. He's trying to get you to change your identity. He's trying to get you to change who you're called to be. He's placing things over you in hopes that you will walk into alignment or in agreement with what he said about you. But I love about Daniel and those men, even though they changed their name, they didn't change their doctrine. Even though the enemy changed their name, they didn't change their faith. Even though the enemy changed their name, they did not change their tenacity to go after God. One thing I want to give you revelation about, this is going to be a powerful revelation to understand about names. Names always transcends the physical. What I'm saying is it's so spiritual when it comes to names. Your names will enter into places before you physically get there. This is why it's powerful to have a good name. When you have a good name, your name will go into a season or your name will go into a room and you have yet to physically step your foot into that room. Where's that in the Bible? Let me give you Bible. Genesis chapter 40, verse 14. But when all, this is after Joseph gives interpretation of the dreams to the cupbearer and the baker. He's in prison. I want you to understand, Joseph is in prison, but watch this when he answers this problem in Genesis 40, 14. But when all goes well with you, look what Joseph said. Remember me, show me kindness. Watch this. Mention my name, mention me, my name to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. Coming later on in that, in that, in that chapter, you will see uh, that they forgot to even mention Joseph. They had the answer solution. They forgot it. But in Genesis chapter 41, Pharaoh has another dream and there's another problem that comes. And so Pharaoh's in a place where he's conflicted. Who can help answer or solve this problem that I have? And then the men start scratching their head. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Watch this because I want you to read in the scripture. In 11, each of us had a dream the same night and each dream had a meaning of its own. Now, a young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he interpreted them for us, giving each man the interpretation of his dream. Watch verse 13. And things turned out exactly as he interpreted them to us. I was restored to my position, and the other man was impaled. Verse 14. So Pharaoh sent for Joseph, and he was quickly brought from the dungeon. When he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Now, listen. It's powerful to understand this is a principle that God has. He will put your name in rooms that you have yet to physically walk in. I'm telling you, in fact, what the Lord told me, he said in 2024, some of you, your rooms are already there and your name is already there and you hadn't physically walked into it yet. You hadn't stepped into it yet. I'm telling you, one of the most powerful opportunities I ever had in my life, I was in a season where I needed a breakthrough, an opportunity, I need God to open a door. And I'll never forget God showed me this. He, uh, one of my professors from Delta State called me. And he said, uh, I'm calling you because uh, I know you, you, you didn't apply for it. But he says one day we were talking in the room about a problem, the disposition, this disposition opening up. And uh, we were just talking about it. And all of a sudden, your name came to me. And he said, when your name came to me, all I did was mention your name. And they said, yeah, let's hire him. 
And so when he called me, he already had the opportunity. My name entered the room before I even walked into the room. And what the Lord wants me to tell some of you in this room, he says, watch your name. Your name is on, in boardrooms. Your name is on tables. Your name is entering into circles. Your name is at meetings at corporations. Your name is at funding meetings. Your name is already there. And the Lord says, your name is there, but watch your feet catch up with your name. Watch your feet catch up with where your name is already at. This is why it's important to be faithful, have longevity, to be integral. Because your name will make it there first. This is the same thing Jesus did. Jesus was talking to Ananias about a man named Saul. And what Jesus told, told Ananias, Saul is in, a, is in trouble. He, need, he needs help. God is having a conversation about his name and he's not there. And the Lord is saying in 2024, mark my word, he told me this morning, he said, tell the church, he says their name are already in rooms that they have yet to step into. And he says their feet in 2024 is going to catch up to where their name is. Tell your prophets, get ready. Your name is already in locations, is in areas that your feet has yet to step into. And the Lord said in 2024, get ready, because they're already talking about your name. Yeah, let's get that young girl from Mississippi. Let's get that prophet that we see on social media. Let's get her to come and do this revival. Let's get her at this major conference. Come on, some of you ought to testify, God, I'm so glad that my name is being discussed. I'm so glad my name is already in the room to be approved for that loan, to be approved for that financial miracle, to be approved for that house. My name is already in the room. Listen, 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 your name is going to get there first. And some of you are called to be name carriers. Name carriers are people who God gets you in the room. Watch this. One of your main responsibilities when you get there is to mention someone else's name. I'm here to tell you something. Some of you think God taking you there is just for you alone. No, you missed it. God will take you there, and when you get into the room, there's going to be a problem that you can't fix. But you're like, I know somebody I can recommend. And when you mention their name as a name carrier, you will help escort them to the next season. But you can only do that when you're healthy yourself. But when you're jealous and in competition with everybody, you can't be a name carrier. Jesus was a name carrier. He was able to take your name and my name to the cross. He was able to carry everybody's name, everybody's sin, everybody's weakness. He was able to carry it to the cross because Jesus was a name carrier. And if Jesus was a name carrier, I want to be a name carrier. Come on, come on. You get into the room and somebody gonna say, "Oh, this a, we need this. We need this assistance. We're having uh, problems with uh, graphics." Oh, hold up! I know somebody. All I gotta do is call them right now, and they're gonna be perfect for what y'all need here. Oh, we need this assistance. We need this. Oh, we need. Come on, we need food. We need a caterer. I know somebody. Let me just call them right now. See, some of you, God says, in this season, next season, He's only giving you influence to help carry somebody else's name. See, he gave John the Baptist influence because his job was not to carry his name. His job was to help, come on, prepare the way to carry someone else's name so that people will be ready for Jesus. And this is what some of you will be. Some of you, and so Satan, he knows this is one of the weapons of God that some of us will get there to carry someone else's name there, to put someone else's name in the room. But then Satan, he's a, he likes to have demonic name carriers. Uh -huh, yeah, oh yeah. And he likes to have people who carry na people's name to like, watch this gossip and lie about them. And I want to help you to understand something. When you mention someone else's name, you better be correct. Because I want you to understand, every, 
Everybody's name ain't just normal. Everybody's name ain't just a casual name. Some people's name have real weight behind it. And so be careful mentioning someone else's name in a room that they're not in and lying about them. Because you end up cursing your own life trying to mention a name, come on, that you're not authorized in an unauthorized way or ungodly way. Lying, what you said about them will come back on you ten times worse. So I don't go in other people's room and mention other people's name in an unauthorized way. Gossiping, lying about their name. Diminishing their character. I keep people's names out of my mouth. One of the best, best ways to live a blessed life, keep people's name out of your mouth. And when other people mention other people's name around you, look, they ain't got nothing to do with me. You heard what? Well, that's them. I'm, I'm not in it. I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about them. I'm not going to discuss their name because I don't know nothing about them. So this is very important. So what God wants to do is how can we restore our reputations? Some of us, we will be honest. The enemy took advantage of you because you did not know better. And you made decisions and you do not have a well reputation. You've been inconsistent. You have not been faithful. Some of you, you stepped out in business. It was a perfect time for you to launch your business. You launched your business, and soon you launched your business. You didn't even create or establish any type of fidelity and faithfulness. You launched the business, and you're late with orders. You launched the business, and you do not carry out what you say you're going to do. You have a nasty attitude, poor customer service, and that has labeled you to be inadequate and so people do not want to do business with you because you don't have a good reputation. You fumbled the season when God called you to have business. There was a window of grace. You stepped out there and you fumbled it. You got tired. You got weak. So what do you do when you do not have a good reputation? Some of you, even in the town, the city that you live in, the job that you have, you do not have a good reputation in the city. People automatically label you by mistakes that you made in your past. And so some of us think the only way we can overcome that, we have to move and go to a different location in order to be blessed. And though God may establish that for certain people, but what if he did not establish that for you? Do you have enough faith that God can redeem your name? Do you have enough faith that God can redeem your reputation? Do you have enough faith that God can cancel the mistakes you made and still honor your name in such a grand way? Can you understand that you can restore your reputation? And how can you restore reputation? Understand that the Bible says Jesus has a name that is above every name. And because he has a name above every name, he has the power to redeem your name. He has a power to help your name be changed. And so when your name is renewed, then your name can come into alignment with the purpose he has for your life. So how can we do that? Well, number one, repentance and deliverance can help God restore your name, your reputation. Because if people, here's the thing, they see you fall, but can they see you remain steadfast? Can they see you produce the level of integral and credibility in how you follow God? This is how you begin to rebuild your name. Some of you, you do have to rebuild and restoring process, rebuilding and rebuilding trust. You have a history of lying to your spouse. You will have to rebuild trust by showing consistency of telling the truth. By showing consistency that you are integral. And you will have to show that some of us, if I apologize, that should be enough. Sometimes you got to have some actions behind that apology. Why tell me you're sorry and still repeat the same toxic behavior? You cannot rebuild a reputation if you want to tell people, hey, I'm sorry, and think that gives you permission to still live unintegral. You still have to have the actions to align with that apology. Change behavior is the greatest apology you can give anybody. I said I'm sorry, but that's permission that's justified to still lie, to still cheat, to still fumble. 
Change behavior is the best apology you can give anybody. Here's the thing. Because with reputation, restoring reputations, people will automatically try to lie and throw things, gossip, remind you of mistakes you've made. You have to live ahead of people's lies. What do you mean by that? Because I want you to understand something. Fruit will always outweigh accusation. So though people must say, accuse you of certain things, the fruit that you've established outweighs the accusation. So when people bring their words to match up beside the evidence, they're saying, you're saying this about them, but they're doing this. So what, they're, what you do or what you've established always outweighs the lies that people bring about you. So rededicating yourself to, to building fruit, rededicating yourself to being faithful and committed, and you have to do this consistently. And the more consistent you become, the more credible you become. And we come to redeeming reputations. Here's my last thing I'm closing. I want you to understand this. Because many of you, when it comes to business, comes to family, marriage, comes to just the community. Some of us, we just do not like the community that we live in because especially hometown is always linked upon your past. Past is always what they, they lift before you. But I want you to understand that when it comes to the resume of your past, the cross automatically cancels out that reputation. One of the things God has the ability to do when God registers your heart and he registers your commitment, and when he does that, he will cause people to forget about what was and to focus and highlight on what you are or what you have become. Many of you don't think that God can cause people to forget about your last season, forget about the mistakes you made. God has the ability to cause people to forget about what you were, forget about what you used to do because of who you become has outlasted the last lie. I want to help some people in this. I want you to understand something. It's very, very powerful to understand this reality. And humility will always make you relevant. Do you want to find out how you can become irrelevant? Be prideful. Pride will make you irrelevant to people who would not even remember you. But what makes your life stand evident is your ability to remain faithful and committed and consistent with longevity. So, Father, we honor you. I want to begin to take some time. I want to pray uh, in this room. I want to begin to pray for people, people who feel that there's no hope for their reputation, People who feel like their name don't necessarily feel like you have a, the best name because you have not been the best steward of your name. Even your last name. Dealing with the generation that comes behind you. Hallelujah. God is in this place. He's redeeming names. In this place, he's transforming reputation. In this place, he is empowering people to walk out the assignment that you have on your life. Hallelujah. We declare in the name of Jesus in this place that nothing will come in the way of the name change. We thank you now, Father, that, Lord, that you are changing names in this room, even right now, in the realm of the Spirit. We thank you that the power of Jacob is coming off of people. And, Lord, you are changing our name to Israel right now in the name of Jesus. God, we thank you now for the name change. We thank you now, Father, that in the name of Jesus, you're renewing destinies. You're redeeming reputations. You're breaking off, God, the shadows of their past. And, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for all things becoming new. We thank you, Lord, that, Father, in the name of Jesus, God, that our name, God, as it goes into rooms, as it travels months ahead of us, as it goes into locations and territories that we have yet to step in. God, we thank you. As our name goes before us, our feet, our feet will meet where our name is. In the mighty name of Jesus. And Father, we thank you now. God, open doors in this room. God, we thank you now. Oh, 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 Lord, the tables, God.
We think that our name is coming across their desk. We think uh, they will mention our name. We think it for divine referrals. In the mighty name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, pray in this place. Come on, you want to break everything that's on your name that's not of God. Come on, that reputation of your past, we declare it be broken in this room. We declare every area where you've been mislabeled. We declare in the name of Jesus, God, we receive a fresh name. We receive a fresh start. We receive a name that has been verified by the fire. Come on, pray, 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 come on, pray. In the name of Jesus. Come on, that old personality is breaking off of you now. Come on, in the name of Jesus, in the realm of the Spirit, God, we thank you that we have a name that's verified. We thank you, God, that by the fire of trials, you're verifying our name. You're giving our name, God, the authority that it because of your authority. Because, God, when we pray in the name of Jesus, we exercise your authority. When we pray in the name of Jesus, we exercise your authority. Come on, in the name of Jesus. So, Lord, as we pray in your name, as we worship in your name, as we decree in your name, as we declare in your name, as we use your name, we declare, God, the demons must flee because of the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. So, Father, we thank you now that your name is redeeming our name. We thank you. We receive new names in this room, God. We receive new reputations, God. Make them forget about, Lord, the tragedy of our past. May them forget about the mistakes we made. May them forget about God the things that we've done. May they forget about them in the name of Jesus. Come on, lift up your hand and pray. She come on, come on. We declare now that you're giving us a name, a strong reputation. Renew the name of our businesses. We declare a new reputation in our business. We declare a new reputation in our marriage. Lord, we know that marriages have failed, God. And marriages may have poor reputations, God. We declare in Jesus' name, God, that you're giving every marriage in this room a new reputation. You're giving us, God, new favor, new light, uh, that we may be able to model the truth uh, of what love looks like in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father that you're giving us a new name. We thank you, Father, that every label that is placed on us that's not of you, God, we declare, God, that it'll be removed now in the name of Jesus, that you remove them in the name of Jesus, we do pray. And Father, we thank you now, we receive that new name. We receive, God, new identities. We receive new personalities. We receive, God, the diligence to walk out and walk in integrity. We receive the diligence to have longevity. We receive the diligence to build credibility in the name of Jesus. So in this place, God, we honor you. And we thank you for it now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. We give you glory. And we give you honor. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name. Come on, give God a praise in this place. Come on, give God a praise. Come on, give Him worship in this room. Come on, worship Him. Come on, lift up your hands and worship Him. Hallelujah. Glory to your name. So we thank you. We thank you for the name change. We thank you for redeeming reputations. We thank you for restoring destinies. We thank you, Father, that you're doing something grand and new in this place. In the name of Jesus. Brother Harris, the Lord says that you are on his heart in this hour. The Lord says that as you get ready to cross over into a new year, you're going to have your moment that Jacob had. As God touched Jacob, and as he touched Jacob, he was 
broken. He took the ligaments out of his joints. He went through a process, what that's called, a process of spiritual development and change. And during that process, he began to change the name of Jacob. The Lord says that will be your story, that you will have a divine name change. I'm telling you, in the 2024, he says, expect your life to go up in every area. And he says that expect everything in your life to evolve. He says, even on the inside of you, there are so many things that he has engrafted in your DNA from a child. And the Lord says he will not let you forget about it. He will not let you abandon it. Even your hands, he's anointing your hands. And I just touch your hands in this environment, in this atmosphere, that he will use your hands to grow and cultivate and do great things in the name of Jesus. So I declare in Jesus' name, in this season where you're giving your name change, in this season where your reputation is about to have a 360 I hear the Lord saying as you yield to him he says he's going to change your name get ready to become Israel get ready to walk out the Israel mandate get ready to walk out the Israel prophecy in the name of Jesus I declare in Jesus name that the reputation of your past may it be dissolved by fire and I declare in Jesus name that you will come up that you will mount up that you will grow up into your new identity in Jesus name Hallelujah. Come on, give God praise. Come on, give God praise for him. If you believe it, his name is changing. Yes, God. Yes, God. The same word for you. The Lord says you're about to go to a metamorphosis season. All this metamorphosis seasons require of you Niagara. Is total obedience. There's been seasons where you've been partially obedient, been partially consistent. The Lord says, but this season of this metamorphosis where He's about to change your reputation is going to require total obedience. And He says, the past mistakes, the things that you yielded to out of hurt, He says, He's about to dismiss all of it. And he says he's about to make your name a billboard for the kingdom of God. And so in the name of Jesus, God, thank you now. I pray for strength for her to walk out this total obedience. Let nothing separate her. Let nothing detour her and distract her. I declare in Jesus' name that you will surrender in this season. That you will not stumble or forfeit what God has called you to. But in the name of Jesus... I declare that that name of your past, that name that associates you with cycles and bondage, we, uh -huh, yeah, we declare be broken off of your life. And I say you receive this new name that God gives you as you walk out that obedience. Oh yeah, here oh, comes a new name. Here comes a new reputation. Ha. Here oh, come. oh, she passed away. Oh, they have passed away. This, I'm telling you, you are a wife. Oh, they you are a woman of God, but the enemy has used your old reputation to shatter your identity and calling. But in the name of Jesus, we break it off your life. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, all things have passed away. All things have passed away. Come on, give God a praise. Come on. Away. Come on, give him worship. Oh, things have passed yeah, away. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's wicked. Let it come on. In the name of Jesus. Away. I declare now that oh, oh, I get it in. Come on. Away. Come on. Every insecurity, let it go. Oh, come on. Let away. rejection go. Come on. Oh, let that fear go. Away. Come on. You cannot take that fear oh, into away. this season of metamorph. Come on. Oh, Afraid of what they're going to think. Afraid of what they're going to say. We let it go in the name of Jesus. Come on, let it go. Let it go. All fear, all worry, all panic, all anxiety. Come on, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Woo! Come on, in the name of Jesus. Come on, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. In the name of Jesus, all these become 
Come on, lift up your hands in this place. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Come on. I want to have real briefly, I want to I wanna pray for two groups of people. I want to pray for those One of them is, is just regarding uh, healing. But another one is regarding this, this vein that we're in regarding a name change. 